Now, I think it's very interesting. The conference I just went to, its title was Embrace. <laughs> now, I did know that our superintendent in, the, in Elam, um, the word that the Lord gave him for Elam's credential holders this, uh, this year was Embrace. And, um, but I wasn't thinking of that when the Lord said Embracing Him. And we're going to be doing, we're working with 1 Corinthians. And so this will be our third lesson, and we're working with a particular way of doing it. But as we go along, if you would like to see the groundwork we've done before, there are two, we've already done two, embracing him, a new way of being, and embracing him sore. And these are interrelated to what we're doing tonight. And um, if there are some of the aspects that, that I mentioned in the beginning that you would like to know more about these. We have DVDs. We also have a CDs available if you would prefer. Um, that's what we're working with. Tonight, as you notice, we're working with focus. And if you've ever owned cats, you know that a bug will make them focus. Um, our cats love, the Lawrence kitties love to go down in the basement, and they love to find a daddy long legs. That's about the only thing they'll find down there occasionally. And they really, you know, they follow that little thing around and then they eat it, of course, and then wonder where it went <laughs> because there's nothing to it, <laughs> you know. But they, for a while, they are exceedingly focused. And uh, so that's what we're going into tonight. All right. Father, I thank you for your people. I thank you for the hunger that you've placed within them through the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that you love each and every one of us in ways we've not even dreamed, that your grace and your mercy and, and just all kinds of goodness you have poured out in yourself, into us, with us, around us. So, Father, we would not be amiss by not being grateful for all of that. And, Lord, as you instructed, we have laid our burdens down. We've received you in worship. We've interacted with your heart. So now, as we turn to your word, increase our ability to interact with you in this dimension. I know you didn't come to leave us a book. You came to leave us a life. And, Lord, you wish to come out of the pages of the book and to be embraced in the reality of I am. So teach us tonight as we look in the book, as we treasure the words, Lord. May those words be kept avenues through which your living water is just exploded within us. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus we pray and everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right. Now, tonight you have in your hands a translation of Scripture that is a little unusual. We're working in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, and um, I've, given you, I've given you a book, I mean a, a, a translation, that, um, because I thought if I just work with this translation, you'll have no idea where I am when you look at your translations. You're free to, counter, to look at it, to compare it. Um, as you'll notice at the very bottom of that one, this is the mirror translation by a man named Fru Francois Dutoit. Uh, he's a South African. And I've met Francois. He's a precious man of God. And he has translated uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, he's not translated all of the New Testament yet. Um, but in reading it, um, in reading this chapter, if I was translating it, I probably would not translate it like Francois did. Um, but the <coughs> attitude that is in the passage, he captured. Now, you need to know in Bible translation, it's a multi-layered thing. You can say, well, which is the most literal and at the same time miss the heart in the thing? You can get a literal word without having the heart of the thing. And you can get a, a paraphrase. All of them are paraphrases, to be truthful, because you can't go word by word in the Greek. It doesn't work. But when you, when you translate and you, you go after one word, if you're not careful, you'll leave the, the energy, the uh, spirit, the emotions of that behind. Because now you've got a wooden word. Uh, the New American Standard translation is known as a wooden translation. It's quite literal, but it's quite devoid of the feeling that comes along with the passage. And so one of the things, and all of you are acquainted with the message, 
by Eugene Peterson, the message is a gut. Mm. This is the way he felt when he read the Greek. And Eugene is a linguist. He's good. Uh, Francois is a linguist, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek. He's good. But he's not just attempting a word for word. He wants us to get the whole measure as much as possible of what is contained in the passage. And so when I read it, I thought he's hit the nail on the head with Paul's exasperation of the people of Corinth. So that's why I'm using this translation. And I wanted you to be able to follow along. In there, the, the, the dark uh, is the translation. The lighter one is his comments. So you kind of help to understand where, why he did that. Now, in a way of introduction, and those of you going to be at Stella Myers, you'll get a little bit of this again, because the Lord has me very much here in understanding something. The way we think about something determines how we relate to it. For instance, if I had several million dollars in the bank, don't get excited, I don't. <laughs> but if I did, and if you did, and if I had a retirement that was endless, and if I had what the world calls wealth, my attitude toward money would be considerably different than it is now. Do you understand what I just said? I walked with a friend a number of years. Uh, she's still a friend, just doesn't happen to be in this area anymore. And she was quite wealthy. And I could not get over how my thoughts did not go with hers. <laughs> and yet she was very frugal, sometimes more frugal than I was. But she never thought about how much did it cost in reference to could she afford it. She was working on an entirely different plane. Now, I give you that, not because we're not going to talk about money. We're not. But because how we think about something determines how we relate to it. And when we're working with the Word of God, when we're working with I am, when we're working with Yeshua, when we're working with the fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we've been drawn into, when we're working with these things, our attitude toward God, if I may just use it this generically, toward God determines how we read this word. If we feel separate from him, then he's high and lifted up, and we're little bitty peons down here. If we have understood what he's done in Christ, then we begin some of the weaving with his life. But we have, as a Western church at least, I can't speak for the Eastern church, but I can, as a Western church, we have really majored in our sin and we have minored in his work. Because what we've seen is important is our doing his work and trying not to do it wrong. You understand what I've said? Yeah. All right. And we do a lot about getting people to repent. Da, 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 and we don't even understand what that word is. It does not mean what we ask it, people to do. And as more translation is coming out and we're getting to know more and more about what the word actually says, we're beginning to re relate to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a whole new way. And one of the things we need to understand, this, this chapter will tell us that we are the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the dwelling place is literal. So really, uh, there's another word for temple in Greek that's not here. There's the, we are the dwelling place of Almighty God. We are the sanctuary. He lives in us. We are not separate. He's not separate from us. And so as we begin to interweave with who he is, and understand that we're drawn into fellowship not because we belong to the same church, because we come from all different denominations here tonight. Yes. <laughs> but we relate together because we're of the same spirit in that Trinity fellowship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit said they will be in us, one with us as we are with each other. Wow, a few years ago that would be blasphemous. So as we began to relate, and we've worked with that relating in the previous two um, lessons, we've worked with that relating quite a bit. But the more we began to relate to him 
as, yes, he's God. Yes, he's Lord. Yes, he's Redeemer. Yes, he's done all of these things. Yes, he's majestic. But when we begin to relate to him as he mirrors me and I mirror him, we are being uh, transformed into the image of the one who has born us, just like in the natural. If you knew my mom and dad, who've long since been with the Lord, but if you knew them, you would understand when you looked at me that I'm their daughter. Now, my brother, whom you know, he's six foot one. Don't quite know how all that happened. They weren't tall like that. They weren't as short as I am, but they weren't tall like that. You would only know that he belongs to them by the shape of his face and his hair. But we resemble where we came from, don't we? One way or the other. And, and now, as I'm getting older, I, there's a reason why I take my hair back. If I had hair on the sides, I look just like my mother. <laughs> I loved my mother deeply, but I don't want to look like my mother. You understand what I'm saying? So I always keep my hair back so that I look like Iris, not Ethel. Though if you knew Ethel, you would love her deeply. She was one of the sweetest ladies that has ever lived. Of course, your mother was too, so I'm sure of that. <coughs> but, but all of that to say, in God, when we got born from above, and that's the correct title, that word, the, the word does not say born again. The word says born from above in the Greek. And I, I make a point of that because so many uh, organizations, cultish and otherwise, use the term born again. And it was common among the Jews. Every time they were baptized, they considered themselves born again. And they used baptism for getting clean all the time. They did many of it. Uh, but we are born from above. We have been made from the DNA in our hearts from God himself and as we have received Christ and moved into this dimension of yes Jesus then we are being remade on the inside just in the image of him so as far as heaven is concerned I look just like my daddy his name is Almighty God and as far as heaven is concerned I look just like my brother his name is Jesus I'm covered in his blood. I've been made righteous by the blood of the Lamb. What he is, he has made me inside. We are moving forward. And what we are beginning to work with in this series is not just adapting to a Christian culture, which we do in the church very well. We learn to talk like those who go to our church. We learn to dress like those who go to our church. We learn not to say certain words and to say other words. And in certain ways, we can talk about this. And in other places, we can't talk about that. You do understand what I'm talking about, don't you? We speak Christianese real good. We adapt. But what we have is a whole bunch of people born from above who are still very flesh motivated. They're only dealing in their prayers and in their lives with what they can see and touch. We're children sons and daughters of the Most High God, with the capability of viewing things from heaven's way of life. And he's called us not to be disciples by being adapting on the outside, but being disciples by allowing him to change emotions ah, through the way I think. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Your mind doesn't need transformation. It needs renewal. That means it was good once. <laughs> it needs renewing. And so as we renew our minds, our emotions begin to grab hold, and we begin to hang on to the emotions that are of spirit, not just the emotions of flesh. We keep waiting to get a way out of all the pressure or get God to change all the situations. And God's getting... And God's saying, I wish you would reread my book and find out that I'm waiting for you to come on up. While you're still in flesh, I want you to see something you haven't seen. 
I want to make your life more than you've ever dreamed by looking at something you can't see right now. But I've given you the capability and the spirit to see it. And so this whole series is about the training of the inner man. Now, in chapter one, we worked with the problem with this church, the Corinthian church, was very, very whirly. I don't know if I would have considered fellowship with them. They did all kinds of stuff wrong. And the beginning thing that out of it came everything else was a spirit of division. Or now I'm going to say what makes this uncomfortable, which is the spirit of competition. Mmm. They thought, oh, Paul is the best teacher. No, Apollos is the best teacher. Oh, no, I, I, I uphold Peter, or Cephas, the book will say. Cephas, and, and another was really holy, said, oh, no, no, gee, I'm just, I'm messianic. I just cling to Christ. And Paul is saying that they're acting like babies. Christians who are competitive have missed the point. All right, competition's not where it's at. And so we went all the way through the first two chapters looking at some magnificent things that have been given to us. But the spirit of competition is still being addressed in the third chapter. We'll even find it addressed way at the end of the chapter, way at the end of the book. But in this, this particular chapter, and you'll look at what I printed out there, verse 1 of chapter 3, Francois thought it sounded best to say, This is ridiculous. Now, he founded this church. He is the apostle over this church. He has authority to tell them this is the way it is. And he says, this is ridiculous. Who am I talking to here? Are you mere spiritual infants stuck in the soul-ruled mode of the flesh, reduced to baby talk? Cooing sentimental gibberish about who your favorite preacher is instead of discovering who you are in Christ. Whoa. Now, I, I wanted to go back. I wanted to look. Mere spiritual infant stuck in the soul-ruled mode of the flesh. In other words, if the flesh is happy, I'm happy. You know the, the saying, if mama's not happy, nothing's happening. We understand that. But in our flesh, if my flesh is happy, all is good. He says, is that what we've boiled down to? Go to a Christian prayer meeting. What are we praying about? Oh, baby stuff. We're asking God to do what God's already promised to do. Mm. I said it. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll provide for you. Now, does that mean we don't ask him? No, but we don't belabor the point. Well, what about all of this? If I pray and continue to pray, he'll honor. He's not sitting up there waiting to see how many times you pray for something. You're not heard for your many words. Matthew 6. Yes, asking for what you need. Then go on and talk with him about what you're feeling and what you're sensing. And then let him talk to you about what he's feeling and what he's sensing. And I'll give you a clue. He'll put your nose in the book. Because he's already said a lot. But he's after a relational conversation with you. Embrace means to hug. <laughs> it means to hug one another. It's awful hard to hug somebody that won't hug back. You know, I, I've hugged people sometimes. They just kept their arms to their side. They let me hug them. But I didn't get nothing. <laughs> you understand? So to embrace him means that, yes, I'm, he's hugging me. He's blessing me. He's giving me all he is. But I'm returning that in my person knowing that by faith I've trusted him. That's what faith means. By faith he will do all in me that he's promised to do. I can trust his promises. So why don't I get on with heaven's business? Instead of staying 
in a soul ruled realm of the flesh where if I don't see it, he hasn't done it. It's about time for testimonies over things God's not yet done, but we know he will. But how can you know he will? If he promised it, he will. I have to tell you something that happened to me. Was it yesterday? No. It was Wednesday. My days, the last few days, kind of blur. I was in so many meetings. I went to this meeting. Can't even remember the name of it, but it, it, was, it was advertised as something about understanding the apostolic gift or something. Was really interested in it. And the guy basically worked with how, what about disciple, discipling? And uh, we're not sent to make converts. We're sent to make disciples. And I, you know, was very interested. That's the series we're working with, in discipling from the inside out. And uh, so he, he was superb. I won't, I won't go over his again, but he was just absolutely superb working with how they work with it in his church, which is a nice, big, large church. And uh, I was very, very interested. And I went up to meet him. And uh, I was with Pastor Charity, and she knew him. And so she greeted him and introduced me. I was glad to meet that. And then we went to his assistant, who had also talked. And she knew the assistant and the assistant's wife. And so we went, and he talked with her and then she said this is Iris Godfrey who has a Bible teaching ministry in Syracuse and he did this of course she does and the God favor of God is all over you and he began to prophesy it wasn't a time for prophecy he hadn't stood up there and prophesied over anybody and he started prophesying over me my mouth I had to <coughs> close my mouth and the prophecy that he gave me was just absolutely phenomenal was right in line with those that have come in the last six months. And I don't get in prophecy lines. But people have called me out, and this is, and it, it's all being, you know, there's, it's time that I trusted what God said regarding that. You understand what I'm saying? That's nothing out of his word. I mean, it, that's not in his word. It is in his word. It's in his promises. But it was like a startling awake. Iris, wake up. Stop doing the baby thing about having to have everything physically and emotionally well for you to begin to do what I call you to do. You trust me that I have said what I've said. And when you enter into that dimension of faith and begin to say, let's look at something a little differently today, Lord. Help me see it another way. Help me see this as you see it. And he will show you in time things that just astound you. And by the way, he doesn't care where you came from, where you're worshiping, what you've been into. He is the God of forgiveness. He's the God of grace. He will receive you and begin to work with you, not on a level of someone that he has given maybe authority to in a realm, but he will work with you in your realm in an authority way. He's no respecter of persons. He forgives freely. Sin was forgiven 2,000 years ago. We need to enter into that reality and begin to step into it and begin to see things as God sees them and become a kingdom people and that means seeing ourselves as he sees us sinless blameless without reproach the glory of God <laughs> my heart's going ooh, ooh, ooh. this is good stuff preaching myself happy <laughs> but that's that's, that's a call. It's not just a call for a prayer to make me feel better. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand me. But we become a church hospital. Always trying to get somebody better or healed. Somewhere along the way, we need to believe he's the healer. Move beyond and go. Now, I know I'm talking stuff that's difficult. But beloved faith is about believing what the book says. Not always waiting till I feel it or see it to grab hold of it. That's not faith at all. If you have to see it to believe it, it's not faith. So we want to move in our interior from a soul ruled mode of always dealing with flesh. All right. Now then. All the way to ver chapter, verse 2. Aren't we excited? <laughs> <laughs> verse 2. 
Maybe Iris needs to go to conferences a little bit longer and not have time to make a bunch of notes. All right. <laughs> I fed you with milk, and now, after all this time, it seems that you have no appetite nor capacity for the meat of the gospel. While you remain on the milk diet of the sole rule realm of the flesh, knowing Christ merely from a human point of view. I'm not going to take us to 2 Corinthians 16. We will work with that in time. In other words, he is high and lifted up. And I'm somewhere down on earth. Unworthy. Where he came to live with me. His name is Emmanuel. God with us. He came to live in you and be with you and to provide worthy over your life. When we say we're not worthy, and I know I'm flying in the face of some stuff, so just love me through it. Don't, don't. We are discounting the work of Christ in our life. Am I worthy without him? No, but I'm not without him. I haven't been without him in almost 50, 60 years. Yes, yeah, 60, oh, it's 60 years now. I accepted the Lord as a young child. I've been with him a long time. It would be really bad not to accept the worthy that he gave me. Would you turn the air conditioning on a little bit? It's really warm. So we're talking about stepping into something that's way beyond normal understanding of following Jesus. It doesn't lack humility. In fact, it will make you more humble in the real way than you've ever been in your life. Not because you've grappled to get humbled, but because you're walking in the face of power and person that you've never dreamed before. There's no pride in that. But faith has grabbed it. And you begin to walk humbly. Humility is not what we think it is. Humility is agreeing with God. It's being prideful to say his work did not work. That I'm not worthy because he couldn't pass. He didn't do that. To always put the caveat there. To say I'm not worthy. Is to always deny the actual work of God. To say I'm not forgiven. Or somebody's not forgiven is to deny the work that Christ did 2,000 years ago. Do we need to receive it? Yes. Do we need to embrace it? Yes. But it was done. And so learning to walk where we are not babies. We have a lot of Christians who believe they're really mature. And they're dealing in sentimental gibberish, trying to get God to do something. When he's saying, I've already done it, will you just believe it and begin to move in it? <whistles> hmm. Now you know why he started. This is ridiculous. Their <coughs> anxiousness about who was the best teacher. All right. Let's continue this verse. You are unable to digest the meat message of what has been concluded and revealed in your, a, in your union with Christ. I'm going to read that part again. You are unable, he says to them, to digest the meat message of what has been concluded and revealed in your union with Christ. There's a huge difference between, between seeing Christ historically and sentimentally and realizing the revelation of the gospel. This is the mystery of grace. God reveals us in Christ. He associated us in Christ before time began. That was lesson one. Jesus did not die as an individual. He died our death and we were raised with him. Ephesians 1 and 2. Correct? In 2 Corinthians 5. I think it's about verse 16. Like it said there a minute ago. It said. Paul says. Of this I am convinced. If one died. Then all died. When Christ died. You died. When Christ was raised, you were raised. And when he comes inside of us, he comes in as the law fulfilled. Do we do away with the law? No, we establish it in our daily life from the inside out. Because it's been given to us fulfilled. He is, the law is Christ. 
it's fulfilled. We're not legalists trying to fulfill it. We're living out its confirmation. A whole new ballpark. A whole new understanding. This mystery of Christ within us. This grace is absolutely phenomenal. Grace is not permissive. If a person becomes permissive in their morality or in any other area of their life, they have misunderstood grace. Grace is an empowerment to live a holy life. Titus 2, 11 and 12. It's the empowerment. The favor of God is the empowerment. We please God because we are in him. Yeah. We are in Christ, correct? I please him. Not because of what I do. I don't get any brownie points for what I do. I happen to have been given the teaching gift. And if you don't come, somebody else has to come because I'm going to teach. And if I don't have anybody to teach, I teach walls. And if Lauren's cats are around, they get it. <laughs> because that's my job. And I love to do it. I love it. I love what happens as the anointing flows through in me. The life that it brings to me. And I pray to you. There is. But there's no brownie points here. There's no hierarchy here. There is the absolute. One in Christ. Drinking his cup. Living his life. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, what do I do? When it doesn't look like that, that's flesh realm. It won't look like that. Spirit realm sees what is not yet. I was in a ministry, listening to a ministry recently, and the guy began this. He was on the guitar and leading in worship, and he began this. He said, I've seen you in the future. And you look much better than you look right now. <laughs> and he had us begin to, to do that. I've seen you in the future. And you look much better than you look right now. And he was speaking to this aspect. Faith sees beyond. Knowing God is answering now. Without seeing. Faith that is seen is not faith. So he stirs us up here in the Corinthian letter. He says this mystery he says, Christ is being imaged in you. Verse 3. Your heated debates and divisions prove that you're totally missing the point of the gospel. You behave like any other spiritually unenlightened person, religiously obsessed with petty party politics while missing the essence of the message. Oh, we can all go, yes, guilty, 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 guilty. You know, we'll talk about how we're all one in Christ and it's all good. And then we have this reserve way back in the back somewhere, but... Lord, we both know that if they went to the same church I did, they'd be better off. If we were all this church or that church or the other church, you know, we'd be better off. It's time to get rid of the reservations. No, no, no. We go where God has assigned us. We're doing what God has assigned us to do. It's not about what church you go to. It's about the Christ you serve. Hallelujah. I want to sing hallelujah. All right. Verse 4. Can you not see that it is not about Paul or Apollos or any teacher you wish to associate with? We are not here to play the one off against the other. Denomination, teacher, whatever. In, an, in a desperate attempt to win your vote to join our group. Both Apollos and I are on the same assignment. We are here for you to influence your faith, to discover yourself in Christ. Every individually, individual is equally gifted in him. I have planted by bringing the gospel to you in the first place. Then Apostle uh, uh, Apollos watered the seed in his ministry to you. But God causes the Christ life to ignite and expand in you. Again, it is back to relationship. Regardless of what you're hearing when you go to church, if you're not developing that embracing relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, then he cannot water fully the seed that he's planted in each of you. 
He is after planting. He is af- he's, be- he's planted seed in you. He's after watering it, bringing it into some fruit for your life. I think, you know, um, the gifts of the Spirit do not produce fruit. Their power for life and living. Relationship with the Holy Spirit produces the fruit. Relationship with God produces the fruit. You can be as powerful as you want in the Holy Spirit in all of the gifts and show very little Christian fruit. But when we operate with this relationship of embracing our Jesus, letting him talk to us, letting him have his way in our hearts, not demanding our own because that gets switched very quickly. You start walking with him as living in you, which we'll get to in a moment. When you start walking him in this way, it's no longer so much about what I would like to do. It's about what he would like to do. And I want to tell you what he does. (laughs) You know, we're always trying to get real of our own will so we can have his. He doesn't want you to do that. He doesn't need you to be empty. He made you full. Didn't he fill you with a spirit? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I just want to be empty of me. There's no... D- if you got empty of you, you wouldn't be there. <laughs> he wants to walk it with you. He happens to love who you are. He took care of who you're not. Mm-hmm. Thank you. We're getting there. <laughs> he honestly took care of who you're not. Now he wants to embrace you and walk with you in your world, blessing you and empowering you to be the living water that he's brought to you. One speaker said recently, not where I just was, but recently he says, why are Christians always so desperate and so thirsty? Didn't he say I would fill you? Didn't he say I would make you a river of living water? Now, that doesn't mean we don't want more and all he's got of us. You understand what I'm saying. But we get desperate for him when we got him. And he's calling for us to be the chapters in Ezekiel where the water's flowing out of the temple. Living water flowing. It was prophetic about the Christian. All right. Verse 6. Uh, no, no. We've got that one done. Verse 7. If all we succeeded to do was to attach you to us as individuals, then we failed you. If you come to Psalm 19 because you like Iris or you like Lauren or you like somebody else here and that's the only reason you come, then we failed. We hope you like us, but that's not the point. The point is for us to grow together through the word and in the spirit. The one who plants is not more important than the one who waters. It is not about us. It is about you realizing God's work within you. His comments. Our ministry has only one objective, to reveal Christ in you. And then he talks about the passage in Philemon. Not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Discover the full extent of your own salvation. It is God working in you both to will and to do. That's in Philippians. This working has uh, out your salvation has nothing in common with the duty-driven, willpower restricted law of work system. It's discovering his working in you energizing you with both the desire and the capacity to give expression to him that's beautiful it is discovering his working in you energizing you with both the desire and the capacity to give him expression to give you expression to to give expression to him i'll say it i'll read it verse eight our individual assignment does not place one above the other we have exactly the same mission How we succeed or fail in that is to our own account. We are co-employed by God, and that's all of us. You are God's agricultural field, or in another context, you are his building, and he's the architect and engineer of the life of your design. He is grace. His grace is the only reference to my skill. His gift qualifies me. Go down to the bold. The faith foundation that I have laid in your lives gives evidence to that. So let the next man take extra caution to build consistent with what grace communicates. Grace alone defines and inspires New Testament ministry. Jesus Christ 
is the only foundation. Nothing that anyone else can possibly teach you can replace him. Imagine the contrast in building materials. One builds with gold, silver, and precious stones, while another uses wood, hay, and stubble. And he makes these comments. By comparison, the teaching of the cross and its glorious effect in the believer's life is like building with gold, silver, and precious stones. Let me just say this. We have been very willing, we have all been very willing to receive the effect of the cross in taking care of our sins and relating us to God. We have not yet understood the glory of the cross in the transformation of the human being into that which expresses Christ himself. Not less than Christ, but bountifully full of Christ, expressing Christ himself. All right. Whereas the wisdom of this world system based on religious good works and not faith is like building with wood, hay, and stubble, which is fuel for fire. Everyone's work will be tested in the scrutiny of real life. It shall be made apparent as in broad daylight, just as gold is tested in fire. What you teach will either burn like stubble or shine like gold. The revelation of man's co-crucifixion and co-resurrection with Christ is the gold of the gospel. If we teach about a person can, can receive Christ and get rid of their sin, but we never teach them that they then become the righteousness of God, we've missed a big part of the gospel. All right, verse 14. If what you teach is based on the revelation of the success of the cross, it will certainly be confirmed in the heat of contradiction. Obviously, to witness the fruit of your labor go up and smoke would be devastating to anyone even though you escape with your own life. Realize that your life is God's building, his sanctuary, designed for his permanent abode. His spirit inhabits you. He designed every cell in your body to accommodate and express him. Glory. You might need to underline that. Put it on your mirror. Every cell of your body was designed <coughs> to accommodate him. Just like fire would burn away the dross, any defilement of God's temple would be destroyed in order to preserve human life as his permanent sanctuary. Why fool yourself? What is esteemed as wise according to popular Jewish sentiment is folly. We might even say according to our culture sentiment. There is no compromise when it comes to wisdom. The only wisdom that matters is what God deems wise, even if it seems foolishness, to the reasoning of typical religion. And we worked with this a little bit last time. Remember that wisdom is always a gift from God. Man's wisdom is something that's acquired, maybe, maybe not. God gives wisdom. Then comes understanding. Then comes revelation. If you don't get wisdom from God, you can't understand the scriptures. If you don't get wisdom from God, you have no way to go. And the neat thing is, he says, let any man, he didn't just say those who are born again, he said, let any man who desires wisdom ask of God and he will give him freely and liberally. Glory. Who did die, Christ die for? Everyone. Hallelujah. We need to become a little broader. Much rather... We would much rather, we must much rather be ridiculed by religion than esteemed as wise by them. <coughs> the dynamic of God's wisdom is the fact that both Jew and Greek are equally represented and defined in Christ. It seems so foolish that God should die man's death on the cross. It seems so weak of God to suffer such insult. Yet man's wisest schemes and most powerful display of genius cannot even begin to comprehend or compete with God in his weakest moment on the cross. Amen. God's wisdom proves the foolishness of secular wisdom. It is on record that scripture, how God outwits the wise of the world. The message translation in Job 5.13 reads, He catches the know-it-alls in their conspiracies, all that intricate intrigue swept out with the trash. The Lord is familiar with the unsuccessful search for meaning in man's empty debates and dialogue. I'm not going to go through the, the Greek study he gives. You've got it there printed. Verse 21, therefore no man has any reason to boast in himself. He's still working on that competition basis out of chapter 1. 
No man has any person, no person, that would be anthropoi, that means man or woman, no person would, has any reason to boast or to brag on themselves, to promote themselves, as if he gained anything that does not already belong to him. For all things you wish to gain already belong to you. Hmm, you're quiet. For all things you wish to gain already belong to you. <laughs> you remember Adam and Eve in the garden? And you remember how the enemy came and tempted them? He said, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. They already were. He tempted them to become something they already were. One of his schemes in the modern Western church is to make sure that God's people do not know who they are. Because if we get a clue, we'll take it. Oh, yeah. If we get a clue what God's really done and what he's really done in coming inside of us, this is huge. What we're wanting, we already have. By faith, it is. If it's a desire in our heart, he lives in our heart, he knows our desires. Count on it. Don't spend it yet. A person that wins the lottery is not safe with that money. Proverb tells us that a inheritance gained quickly is not profitable. The reason is because, back to a mindset, if we've not been trained in how to handle that kind of money, we will just spend it, which people do. They run their lives with it. But when the mindset has been trained on how to handle the riches of heaven, the riches of earth are no problem. So there are things to be shown. There are things to be given. It's not that he doesn't wish to be abundant in every way to us. I, d I don't teach the prosperity end, but the reality of it is it is correct. The God will give and give much. That's not the point. When it becomes the point, we become in trouble. But we already have everything that he says, everything you wish to gain already belongs to you, just like it did with Adam and Eve. Again, we're working with a mind thing. We're working with a mind renewal. And it says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. You are not winning any competition by picking your favorite teacher amongst Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. They all belong to you anyway. The world belongs to you. Hmm. It didn't last time I looked. You, you're quiet. But the last time I looked, Joe and I still don't own any land. Lauren does, praise God. We live in a flat below her in her house. But... The world belongs to you. So whatever you desire is already yours. When we begin to enter the attitude of it's already mine, things change. And we're able to handle them because we've entered into an attitude of sufficiency. Now notice the next phrase. Life and death are yours. Oh, 
I don't know how to wrap my mind around that. And you can go to the Greek, and that's what it says. I do not know how to wrap my, wrap my mind around the fact that whether I'm living in this body or whether this body is, is dead, um, it all belongs to me. What do you mean? I think he has to give us some revelation, but he's letting you know things that are way beyond our ability to control actually belong to us. In what you now have in this present moment, you already possess the future. <laughs> I've seen you in the future, and you look much better than you look right now. All right. Not even death can threaten what we have in this life. As much as Christ is inseparably God's own, you are the property of Christ. You are one with him. Most of our translations say, whatever is belongs to Christ, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Everything that exists belongs to to God. Everything that exists, he has given to Christ. And everything that belongs to Christ belongs to us. The world, life, death, heaven, the future, and all that is. Paul is called here. What I, I see him doing is he comes along and he says, come on, look up. Come on, get into the program. Get into being transformed in the way you're thinking and the way you're responding. Come on, let the Spirit of God do some changes deep within so you're not thinking the same old thoughts. Let the Word of God come up and slap your mind around a little bit and come on, receive these pieces. And right at the end of it, he just goes, you got the world, you got life and death, you got all that's Christ, everything is yours. <laughs> and I want to go, yes, Lord, but I don't get this. And his invitation is, come on up. I'll show you. I'm in you. You're in me. We're in the Father. We're in the Spirit. Every cell in your body breathes with Christ. You're inseparable. So what he does with your desires and your wishes, we give them over to him, and we think in there is lost. But all that does is relieve us of the burden of carrying it. He already has it for us down the way. It comes about and it doesn't look like what I thought it would. In years past, there have been times, and you've probably done this too, so I'll just share. I would cry out for a friend who could understand me. My daddy never understood me. Bless Joe's heart, he gives it a go. <laughs> my mom didn't see what the problem was, but then she was my mom. I thought a lot like her. I am a lot like her. But we long for somebody else just to understand us. Just send me a friend who can really, and you know he has, It's him. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never betray me. He'll never put me down. And he empowers me to bless everyone and never be lonely. He wanted to fulfill my utmost desires, and he's done it with himself. It didn't come all at once. Friendships don't develop that way. But none of us have been left out of anything in him. What we now lack, what we now want. And those wants change in us. You know, when I had four small children, <laughs> now I've got four children all in their 40s, not quite children. My particularly wants have changed. And God help me if all I ever wanted surrounded them. God help them if that was the case. 
because eventually our circumstances change so that the things we thought we wanted have we look back they were fulfilled they didn't look like what we thought they would but we got delivered from all of that as we move forward in knowing that what we had was all in him and if he has it I've got it do I understand that no but I'm called to it just like you are it's a calling of faith and Paul took these weak, fleshly Christians. King James says carnal. They were believers, but they, I mean, they were just ruled by their flesh. Sound familiar? And he said, you own everything. He didn't say, you own everything if you'll get a hold of this. He just says, it's ridiculous that you don't know it already. Our call is much broader, much more majestic, much more awesome than what we see when we look in the mirror. We need to begin to make some declarations to ourselves, speaking personally. I need to look in the mirror and not say, well, you're not looking so bad. Now that you're in your 70s, you're doing pretty good, honey. I need to start saying, Iris Godfrey, you're a majestic spiritual creature, you. Come on. <laughs> Let's do this today. I'm not sure Joe can live with that. We might, have to, we might have to do something here. But it's time we began to believe. And I wanted to pull up my Bible and hold it. You know, this thing kind of inhibits that. But it's all here where I can read, so we're good. You know, we need to grab hold of it that, hey, he's made me awesome. He's made me like him, and he's flowing out of me in awesome ways to my neighbor, to the lady at the store, to the child that comes along. And when we begin to touch people, the relating of Christ begins to touch them. Because we know what the word says, and we are allowing him to teach us that by faith, that is, that's me. That's me. So, you have it with you, take it and reread it. And then you read it in the version you like, and you'll find that it actually is saying that. If you try to compare it verse by verse, you'll argue. But if you look at it in the Greek, you'll find it. Yeah, I know most of you don't know to do that. But if you do that, you'll love it because it's, it's saying what the Greek is going out and going, yes. He loves us so. He's not left any of us behind, and he's not left anything behind for us. Our uniqueness gets in our way. Because I don't look like you, and you don't look like me. And that very uniqueness that we love gets in our way because we always compare. He'll say later in the in the in the First Corinthians, comparing themselves with themselves, they became fools. Because you and him are the most dynamic life he's ever given birth to. And he couldn't be more pleased. Now if we just settle with that one point we'd take some steps in faith. He loves you. Father, how we love you back. But I know the point isn't how much we love you. The point is how much you love us.